These five chefs are all hoping to become the next professional MasterChef champion. Today, they face their first challenge. Three tests set by chef Monica Galletti, seasoned diner Greg Wallace, and two Michelin star British chef Marcus Waring. I'm actually looking forward to cooking for Marcus Waring, but at the same time, quite nervous because he has very high standards. Hopefully, I can prove that my food is good enough and show that I'm up there with, with the best. The key for me is not to break down. That's it. If I don't break down, I have a good chance of winning. Only the best will make it through to the quarter final. These chefs might not be ready just yet, but if they've got it, Marcus and Monica will spot it. Welcome, chefs, to Professional MasterChef. I don't think you have any reason to be nervous. Because what we're asking of you right now is for you to cook your own dish. Your signature dish. We're looking for great dishes. We're looking for some skill. We're looking for something exciting. This is a fabulous test to show us what you guys can do. So cook your hearts out. One hour. Let's go, guys. I'm a head chef owner of a, of a supper club on a tube carriage. It's an opportunity to really showcase food that comes from my ideas and put it in a really London setting. I went to university, did a bit of studying, but was always cooking on the side in some hotels. Then started doing private stuff. We work off a tabletop student oven in a weird location with very low budget kitchens. So I want to test the metal. Can this hold up against some of the best people in, in the country? I have nothing to lose. Do you make a living out of these supper clubs? I do indeed. Just. Fantastic. So you've not actually worked in, in any, any, any restaurants I've before? I've worked, you... you know, during university, I've been in kitchens, but unfortunately nothing sort of at the high end. OK, so, so have you been pretty much self-taught after that? Or... Pretty much self-taught after that, yeah. What are you doing for us today? I am making a, a supreme of guinea fowl sitting on a celeriac milk fondant. And there's a little plum gelée on the side. It's like a set jam uh, and some micro herbs. When I was putting it together, I was thinking, could I cook this in my own environment? And the answer is yes, I believe so. All right, Alex, mind the gap. Thank you very much. I, I have my doubts about, about Alex and, and this dish. Um, I'll be happily surprised if it works. Um, I'm also a bit worried about his skills as a chef. Do you know what, though, Monica? Some of our best chefs in this country are self-taught. Who's to say this guy isn't one of them? We don't know. I work in a restaurant in Newcastle. It's a very popular restaurant. Uh, we're exceptionally busy, great reputation in the area. I'm the sous chef here. 99% of the time, I'm just sort of running a, just a section in the kitchen. When the checks are flying in on a Saturday night, you feel like your world's falling apart around you, but that's that's amazing. Like that's that's why we do what we do, you know. I love it. I, just, I won't ever want to be anywhere else, you know. Daniel, welcome. Tell me what you're cooking. Lamb loin with razel hanu, uh, sort of marinated in that. I've got a little cauliflower couscous, cauliflower puree, some goat's curd, and a little bit of apple. So you've got a lamb loin that you've got with a Middle Eastern spice. Yeah, Raza Hulu. And a red wine shoe. So it's very much North African, Middle East meets Europe here. I wouldn't say it was risky. It's flavours that do all work together. Just whether I can bring them all together, hopefully I can. You have done this before, haven't you, this dish? Sort of. Sorry? Sort of. Sort of? I've done bits of the dish. But you have not done this dish I've yet? I've never had this dish completely on a plate ready. You're brave. Do you know what the exciting thing is here? 
no one has seen this dish prepared yet, <laughs> not even the chef. <laughs> this is true. Good luck. Thank you. Daniel's an interesting character, coming here with his signature dish that he's never tried before. Wow. Goat's curd on the lamb and the rosalie noon, I, I suppose, is refreshing. I'm always up to trying new things. You're halfway. You're halfway. I work in a hotel restaurant, and my role is sous chef head chef. My mum was a chef. She said to me once, I was helping her in the kitchen, she's like, you've got lots of flair. It's like, oh, I plated up for fish and chips. She's like, yeah, but you're 12 and you're good at it. <laughs> so that kind of put me into it. My mum and dad used to send me off places. They sent me down um, a couple of three years at restaurants down in Glasgow. I've been to London just for a couple of day trials, just one star, just to see what it's like. I think I want to see if I can get a niche for my style, if I can find out what, what kind of food I like to cook. I know how I like to cook, and just to see where I want to go with it. Jamie, what are you making for us? Turbot wrapped in chicken skin. All right. Morel mushrooms, langoustines and asparagus. Where are you from? Uh, St Andrews in Scotland. The home of golf? Yes, it is. Sir. Will it be the home of the MasterChef champion? Um, yes. <laughs> what is it you're hoping to, to show everyone here today? That I can cook. And it's flair, technique, seasonality, everything a young chef should be, should be aspiring to be. Jamie, there's a lot going on. You put yourself under enormous pressure. If you can get it all done, I'll be quite impressed. It's going to blow your mind. Blow my mind! Blow your mind. <laughs> Jamie's fish is wrapped in, in a chicken skin. I can imagine how it would work as long as he gets that skin crispy enough and the fish cooked properly underneath it. I like the way he's coming across. He's got a great character. You know, I like that. Cooking's everything to him. I think that's going to come across on the plate. I was a semi-professional water polo player. I was with the national team of Malta as well. I gave up a 15-year career for cooking. My passion for cooking is very, very strong. My idea of cooking was never fine dining. Never. For me, it's all about flavor. It's all about food. You know, I mean, when you go to fine dining, it's a lot of elements in the plate and a lot of preparation. And I'm not, I'm not really into that. You know, I'm more into quality, simple food. But since I've been in London, I just got a new perception of, of fine dining, you know, like, and I'm kind of liking it. Sean, where are you from? I'm from Malta. Ah, OK. Yeah. OK. Is there any of uh, Maltese cookery in this dish? Not really, no. Because uh, I moved in to... I moved to London, so I'm the type of person that gets influenced by his surroundings. And game is very, very popular in the UK. So I chose to go with game. I'm making a breast of squab with a, a poured glaze that's infused with some mandarin and white balsamic. And I'm making a pea foam and with an Iberico crisp. Are there any veg that are going with this, or is it just the pigeon and the foam? The pigeon, the foam, the glaze, and the Iberico ham. And, yeah, that's it. Sean is doing poached pigeon with ruby pork glaze and a pea foam with coconut milk. Pigeon is quite a delicate flavour. He has to be very careful with what he puts with the pigeon breast. Pork glaze could be a nice addition. Just get the balance right of the sweet and sour. No veg, no potatoes, no rice, no pulses, nothing at all. That is slightly concerning. I work in a restaurant that's in a village pub, just on the outskirts of Cambridge. I am the sous chef here. In my career, I've worked in some five-star hotels, cruise ships. I've worked in an events company, doing large banqueting. I like to try and be imaginative. I think combining traditional flavors with flair will kind of help me be distinguished from other chefs. Hey, George. Hey. What are you making for us? Um, so today I'm making a uh, lamb loin, uh, sous vide, with three different ways beetroot, baby fennel, some fennel puree, and some wild garlic as well. Why this dish? 
I think it kind of reflects myself on a plate. It's, uh, I'm not trying to overcomplicate too many of the ingredients, but at the same time, I'm trying to make it interesting and uh, balance the flavours. I uh, don't think there's any more way of complicating a beetroot than doing it three ways. The, the style of food that you're doing for us today, is this what you're doing in, in your workplace at the moment? This is pretty similar, but at the same time, I think I'm tweaking it slightly to make it a bit more refined and... This is not your normal pub grub, though, is it? No. No. No, no, it's not. George, putting some big flavours next to lamb. Beetroot three ways, beetroot one way. Done well is always good enough for me. You've got five minutes left, guys. Sixty seconds left. That's it. Stop. Gastro Pub George's signature dish is loin of lamb served with potato fondants, baby fennel, fennel puree, pickled red and golden beetroot, and a beetroot jelly. What's missing from there? Yeah, I attempted to blend half of the beetroot jelly I made to turn into a gel, just to add an extra uh, saucy element to it. But I had some technical problems. <laughs> but that's okay, I think. It's still a nice dish to me. Good. Good, I'm glad you like it. I'm glad you like it. I like the lamb still pink. I think it could be a little less cooked, but I'd love to see it roasted on a higher heat so it gives it a depth of, of more of that roasting flavour. It's not coming through. Your fondants are really lovely, well cooked. The pickled beetroot is not necessary, I, th I think. I do like the fennel, but then it's a bit undercooked. You've poached the lamb? Yeah, and then sealed it afterwards. For me, though, I don't think the poaching has enhanced the flavour of the lamb, and I think the lamb's quite bland. And I think sometimes it's easy to get lost with the technical aspects of cookery, mm. when, in theory, we've been cooking in a classic way for so, so, so long, and it's been so good, sometimes... We need to stick to these things. I think you've got some good flavour ideas. I think this isn't your normal style. I think you've poshed it up for MasterChef and I think you've lost your way. I think I agree. Would that be right? Yeah, yeah, I think I agree. Your pubs won awards for a reason. Probably because it cooks good, wholesome cookery. Mm. And George, that's just what I wanted from you today. I think Marcus was pretty right. Maybe I should have just did more of what I know, to be honest. Twenty-seven-year-old sous chef Jamie has made roast turbot wrapped in chicken skin and langoustine, served with green and white asparagus, braised peas, broad beans and morels, a gem lettuce puree, violet potato and a fish velouté. I'm the son of a fruit and potato merchant and if my father ever, ever saw me serve purple potatoes, I think he'd pick them up and throw them at me, <laughs> personally. It's just an unusual colour and it doesn't look real. Um, but that's not to say that it, it, it doesn't taste great. I'll tell you what, Jamie, you're an old-fashioned chef who likes a bit of butter, aren't you, mate? That is as rich as you like. Uh, good seasoning. I really like your sauce. Uh, I like the fish with the, the chicken skin on it. it, gives it a crispy texture. I like the salt across it as well. There is a lot going on there. I'm amazed you've got it all done in an hour. The green asparagus, I like the way it's cooked. White asparagus, for me, is not cooked enough. I like your sauce, your take on a velouté that you've made. Um, it's full of the, the flavour from the, the fish bones. Jamie, you can cook. The sauce is excellent. I just think that you should have 
taking off some of the things, take off the puree, take off one colour of asparagus, um, take off the peas potentially, and just focus on, on, on a great piece of fish. Okay. You should have just pulled back and you could have the, a really good dish here. Yeah, of course I can take some things off the plate, as long as I keep my cooking at as high level as he wants it to be. Newcastle chef Daniel's first attempt at his signature dish is Raz El Hanout, spiced loin of lamb. Served on a bed of cauliflower couscous with raisins and almonds, accompanied by courgette ribbons, goat's curd, apple julienne and coriander cress. Daniel, the blood that's, that's all over the plate, did you not rest the meat or drain it? Just sort of ran out of time towards the end, sort of let it rest properly, so I just had to get it carved and on the plate. When I get the lamb and, and the meaty jus with a, with a little bit of wine taste on, on the back, that's a nice flavour. When I pick up a cauliflower puree and I put it on the lamb, that, that's nice. You know, there's, there's depth there, 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 there's creaminess. However, when you put the jus, the curd and the puree together, heaven only knows how your palate's supposed to work that out. You've basically got three sauces mingling into one. Elements of it would work. The razzalanut with the couscous would work, but... Uh... You can't know if a plate of food works if you haven't tasted it together. Daniel, I think this dish is lost. I think it's lost in its translation. I would love to have seen maybe the lamb sliced with some fat on it, marinated, and maybe quickly pan-fried or seared to go on top of, of the couscous. That's what I'd be thinking when I'm thinking of a dish like this. It wasn't right whatsoever. I think, you know, you get one chance and I think I blew it, so... Salve. Classically trained Sean has made breast of squab with an Iberico ham crisp. He served them with a coconut pea foam, a mandarin and balsamic port glaze, micro red chard and garlic flowers. The pigeon is beautiful and tender. With an interesting pea sauce, I quite like your style. And I quite like the boldness of your approach. It's interesting, it's intriguing, it's brave, but I actually quite like it. It's really hard to tell how a chef is if all he does is cook a pigeon breast. You can't carry on through the competition only cooking one element and making a sauce. You know, Sean, this is about showcasing you, and if this is it, I'm worried. I'm not. <clears throat> You're not worried? No. That was, that was fantastic, the way Marcus spoke about me and the way he spoke about my food. That was great. 29-year-old supper club chef Alex's dish is guinea fowl served with celeriac milk fondant, wild boar sausage, cayenne-infused plum gelée and guinea fowl jus. I like the colour on the guinea fowl, lovely and golden. However, I saw you put that in the oven, you still had 28 minutes to go. It does not take 28 minutes to cook a breast of guinea fowl. Obviously, it's going to be overdone. The poached celeriac, it would have been nice if she have caramelised that a bit. If you did it as a real fondant, it would have given it that buttery texture that I think it needs. The plum jelly, you've adjusted the, the natural sweetness and, and sourness of that plum. I bet you the, the raw plum tasted better. That's what worries me. I think you may lack a chef's kitchen experience because the cooking of each of those parts leaves a little bit to be desired. I haven't been working full-time in a professional kitchen, but that aside, it wasn't a disgrace. Yeah, I, I know that there are things that I could have done better. There's an introduction to our chefs today, and it's good to see what level of cooking they're at. 
I, I don't think we agree on, on who was the best today, because you really liked Sean, didn't you? I think Sean, what he put on the plate, was good. And you have to look at what was on the plate, not what wasn't. I don't know whether Sean has got what it takes, but I do know he's worth another look. You've got to agree with that. I expect more. Mm. I really do. And I hope if we give him the chance, he better up the ante. I don't know what's, what's coming up if I get through, but I'll push myself this time. I'll push myself a bit more. The best dish I tasted today was from Jamie, with the, the lovely sauce, the turbot with the, with the chicken skin. But there's a hell of a lot going on on that plate. Um, that he could have taken out of the equation and still sailed through. But I think he is, is, is definitely one to watch. I think I've also seen the competition. I think I've done enough with improvements to be made. What do you make of George? George from the pub. I think George came here today and tried a little bit too hard and got lost along the way. And he certainly didn't need to do that beetroot jelly. It's not what he does. It's things that this young chef, I find, will learn as, as we sort of guide him along this journey. I, I, I like the way he's working, and, and I think this young chef deserves a, a chance. Whenever I get criticism, feedback, I always uh, work on it. I try not to let it get me down too much and just try and fight back, really. I'm a little concerned for Alex, although I have a certain sympathy for him, because I think he's got some nice ideas. But he obviously hasn't spent as much time in a professional kitchen as the others. Mm. And the question is, how far off the pace is he? This was his signature dish, and it was the guinea fowl cooked for almost half an hour. So if he can't do that now, what more has he got? We've been at this stage before. People surprise you. They turn it around. I'd just love to go through. Having said that, I may say, actually, we're looking for someone who, you know, can, can get off the bat straight away with perfect cooking, etc. I don't know. Whether Daniel is a decent chef or not, what he did here today, I think, was very silly. And that was he came in here with a dish he'd never cooked before, and I think we tasted the consequences of that. I, I know where he was going with, with the lamb, the spice, the couscous. That could have worked. But then the lemon juice through those courgettes and apples are completely lost on me when it's, it's a whole mouthful on the plate. Hopefully. I can prove I can do better, because I know 100% that that was absolutely nowhere near as good as I can cook, and I don't really know what I was thinking. This is not easy. Well, the question is not who impressed you, who are you willing to take a chance on? Well, I think I know who I'd like to send home. We have now made a decision. Thank you for all your hard work. The chef leaving the competition. Is Alex. Thank you. to kind of do more but you know I don't have the the backlog of professional experience that the other guys do well done very well done you know what you're gonna have to really up your game for the next round all of you We've got four of them left. What challenge are you going to set them now? Now, I would like them to take this belly of pork, bone it out, and prepare it ready to be stuffed, rolled, and tied. How long they got? They've got 10 minutes. I want to see how this is done. Go on, show me. Right. So the first thing I'm going to do is remove the ribs that you can see here. I'm guessing that you don't want too much meat left on those ribs. We don't want too much waste at all. I mean, these ribs you can use for sauce or, or even make your, your spare ribs with them. Look at that. That's a beautiful piece of meat. What are you doing now? I'm going to roll this belly up, so I'm going to remove half the skin. Because if you didn't remove half the skin, half of the skin would be inside and just wouldn't cook. It's 
pour that gently. Once it's done, turn it back over and I'm going to then sort of open it gently. I'm making it thinner so that when you roll it, it's sort of more even. Yeah. Okay. So at this point, you would season it. It's a big piece of meat, it's very thick, um, so it needs to be seasoned from the inside. We have some pork mince here. Okay, so. The mistakes that I can see they might make is A, not to take all the skin off, and then B, not to open it up and thin it out further. So now I've rolled it, it's quite firm. I'm going to tie it up. Okay, so string all the way through the bottom there comes back up and then around again. Does it have to be that neat? I mean, can't you just sort of bundle it up like a parcel? It's a beautifully prepared belly of pork with a lot of love, a lot of respect. You can't just bundle it up. And there we have it, Greg. That is stunning. Stunning. There's no reason why they shouldn't be able to do this at all, is there? This is a skills test I expect every chef coming through a professional kitchen to do. Let's get them in. Let's do it. First up is classically trained Sean. His pigeon dish impressed Marcus in the last round, but Monica and Greg were less convinced. I still have to win Monica and Greg over, so this can really do it for me. It can make or break, I think. What we want you to do is stuff and roll that belly of pork ready for roasting. OK. Have you done much butchery before? I haven't done work with the belly with the ribs on. Ten minutes, mate. Off you go. Okay, three minutes. You're halfway. I'm not a chef, but the way I would prepare that at home is the same way you did, which was score it, salt it, and then lay it flat in the oven. But it ain't going to work if you've got to roll it up. In the restaurant side of things, you would need to trim out any excess fat on the inside, open it up a little bit, and then stuff it and roll. So it's all even and it will all cook okay. properly. You would also need to remove at least half of the skin that's on here and then you have a presentation bit of crackling on the top. Look, no one goes out on this round. You've still got another round to do. Pull your socks up, keep your head up high and, and, and step it up. It's intense, it's intense. But I wish it was something I didn't know because now I'm more upset because it was something I could have done better, you know? 27-year-old sous chef Jamie's turbot wrapped in chicken skin was a hit, even if the plate was a little overcrowded. I'm very calm, even if I'm under pressure. I just kind of try and keep a level head, and if I know it, I know it. If I don't, I'll try and wing it. Right, that belly of pork, what we want you to do is stuff it, roll it, bind it, ready to go in the oven. 
10 minutes. Jamie, let's go. You've had three minutes, Jamie. Four minutes left, Chef. Done. Yep. Jamie, how did that go for your brother? Start off better than it ended, I think. I shouldn't have taken the skin off, I don't think. You've attempted the task really well. You removed the ribs off first, which is what you're meant to do. Trimmed off any excess fat and then went to remove the skin. But then you just realised at the end that you should have left a piece of that skin on. Yeah. I'm pretty impressed with what you've done. And it's a great attempt. Good job, mate. Off you go. Thank you. Good boy. Mm. They were impressed with my butchery skills and they were impressed with my knife skills and I managed to do a good butcher's knot, so I think on the whole it was a really good test. Newcastle chef Daniel just made it through after serving a dish he'd never cooked before. I was kicking myself, just have been so stupid really, so I've got a lot to prove and hopefully I can. I, you know, I've got quite a bit of confidence that I can sort of change their opinions around, so. Daniel, you've got 10 minutes to sort out that pork belly. Yeah. Off you go. You've had three minutes, Daniel. Seven minutes left. Three minutes left. All done? As done as I'm going to be, yeah. <laughs> Some great skills on display. You could remove the ribs, no problem. Uh, you know you've got to trim off any excess fat on there. You know how to tie the meat up. What impressed me was that once you'd taken the ribs, you then sliced two flaps and opened it right out, just exactly as I see Monica do. What you didn't do was remove half the skin. It's, it's crazy, because in the restaurant where I work, we, we take the skin off every time we do it, and I don't know what, maybe the nerves or something, I don't know why I didn't take it off, but... Last time I saw you, we announced he was going home, you, you had your head in your hands and breathed the biggest sigh of relief I've <laughs> ever seen. How, how do you feel now? About a billion times better. <laughs> well done, Daniel. Off you go. Thank you. That's better, Daniel. Much better. I've sort of redeemed myself with the skills test and we'll see what the next task brings and hopefully smash it out of the park, like, so we'll have to see. Last up is 23-year-old George, whose signature dish was an over-elaborate departure from his award-winning pub style. 
I'm pretty good with my basic skills. If it's something I've never done before, I think it might actually be a bit easier. I'd rather that than something I do know, and then go to do it and do it completely wrong. You've got ten minutes to prepare this pork belly. Off you go. Come on. Thanks. You've had three minutes. You're halfway. Keep going, George. Got three minutes left. All done? Yeah. Yeah, I'm done. Yeah, cool. It looks absolutely perfect. This is how I would tie a piece of meat that was going in the oven. You've also removed all the skin off but it's also nice to leave a strip on there so you've got a beautiful piece of crackling along the top when you cook it. Very impressed with what you've done here. Going for a mental checklist of what you did compared to George, he's taken the ribs out, he's trimmed the excess fat, he's fanned it out and he's tied it up pretty well. George, that's not a bad round, mate. Thanks. Thank you very much. Cheers. Very well done. Off you go. Definitely a lot happier now, yeah. But I'm not counting my chickens yet. <laughs> Greg, you know how I feel about butchery and that it's an essential skill for every chef. We have one chef who stood out from the rest, a couple there who did okay, and, and then one, oh, you know, that's got me a bit worried on how he's prepared today. It's over to Marcus next. Marcus Waring was one of the youngest chefs in the country to win a Michelin star. The second came soon after. To get a Michelin star when you're 25 is just insane. That takes some serious hard work um, and a, a lot of dedication. He has got that classical French grounding, but very much inspired by British produce and British food, and uh, I think Marx is true to that. This takes me back to when I was working in Paris uh, and also working at Gavroche. The dish is uh, roasted squab pigeon with uh, onion puree uh, and beautifully buttered potatoes. And then we're going to make a pigeon sauce with Madeira, but we're also now going to use the chopped liver and hearts uh, to finish the sauce off. And then we've also confit the legs as well, and we're just going to very quickly pan roast those. This sort of work and this sort of butchery I really, really enjoy because this is using everything apart from this bit. So we just take that off and we throw that away. Along with the claws, feet. Take off the wings. And just cut off the neck bone. I've done a lot of these over the years. Open the bird up. We season the pigeon really well. Put the pigeon in first. I then add some uh, cloves of garlic, some thyme, and then just leave the pigeon to sit on the side. Keep rolling it around the pan. We're just colouring the bird. Potatoes. You start to see the marriage, the flavours, the similarity. It'll all start to come together. You've got potatoes with thyme and garlic and butter. You've got your pigeon there with your thyme, your garlic and your butter. This is where you want to be. I don't want to be standing over here just doing all the fancy stuff. I want to be over here. I want to see the chefs cooking. I want to see them uh, watching the, the food change in front of them. I want them to understand what it is they're doing here. I don't want them just to be dressing beautiful plates. I want to see the chefs that understand cookery. And that's being on the stove, cooking with the ingredients. 
The smell is amazing. For the onion puree, white onions are cooked down with garlic and chicken stock under a cartouche or grease-proof paper lid, which stops the moisture from escaping. I'm just going to take the pigeon out of the pan. And just touch it, it's just nice and firm. And just let it rest somewhere warm, away from this intense heat. I'm going to make the sauce. Pigeon bones. Got some leek, carrot, shallot, bay leaf thyme, a little bit of tomato puree. Madeira. Give me the red wine. Reduce, pass, and then you end up with a beautiful sauce like that. The last stage is to pan fry the confit legs and add some of the reduced sauce. Now you just want it to cool down and to get sticky. Look at that. Wow. Now we're going to dress the plate. Potatoes, I'm just going to very, very lightly just break them, crush them. Put the pigeon on. Push our legs. Take our sauce, put in the liver and the heart, which has been chopped. And then we're going to finish it with some wild sorrel. And there we go. It's my squab pigeon with onion puree, new potatoes, and a beautiful, rich, offal pigeon sauce. Can't wait to see what the chefs are going to do with these beautiful ingredients. Really, really excited. In front of you are two squab pigeons. It's a luxury ingredient and needs treating with respect and care. Beside us, we've got two tables of fantastic ingredients. We've got herbs, we've got berries, we've got peas, we've got lemons and shallots, black pudding, pork belly, potatoes, bread. Great ingredients. I am looking for a great dish beautifully executed, but I'm looking for some big flavour. Ten minutes to come up and choose from these lovely ingredients and then one hour to make us a splendid pigeon dish. Come and choose your ingredients. I love pigeon. One of my favourite things to eat. I love to cook as well, just as much as to eat. I still don't know which of the pigeon I'm gonna use beside the breast, but I think I have quite a vision of it. It's all about the pigeon, so it's not understating the pigeon, keep it simple. I've cooked pigeon quite a lot in the past, so I'm feeling quite confident today. You have one hour, off you go. You've really got to get the right choice of ingredients to go with pigeon. It's all about balance and flavour. Pigeon can be really big flavour, so you need something bold that sits next to it. To cook for Marcus Waring, I mean, is quite a daunting thought, but at the same time, there's not many people that could give you as good feedback and as good criticism as he could, really. I'm a good role model, especially for a chef of my level. George. Hello, Chef. Tell me, what are you, what are you cooking? Seared pigeon breast. Yep. And I'm going to make kind of like a, almost a cassoulet with the poi lentils, uh, some pancetta, braising the legs, and then make like a port sauce using the wings. What's inspiring this dish for you? What's in your head? I suppose I kind of listened to the comments you gave me in the first round. Stick to more of what I know, Good. go for flavour, try not to overcomplicate things. This is you cooking as if you're back in your kitchen at work. Yes. So we're going to get George now. Yes. Good. Can't wait. Oh. 
where George is working, I would have thought they would have cooked the pigeon on the bone itself. He's taking it off. When you put those breasts into the pan, skin side down, the first thing that happens is the skin tightens and it starts to tighten the breast, so it starts to curl. When the breast is attached to the carcass, it prevents that from happening. But if he does it slowly and gently, he could still get it right. It could work. I started off on a good foot with Marcus. I'm really happy that he's on my team, you know? Now I need to prove to him that he's right, you know? He's right, it wasn't just a one-off, you know? Sean, Jeff. Pigeon, second time round for you. Yeah. What are you gonna do different? I'm gonna use the breast, and then I'm boiling some new potatoes with some rosemary and garlic to boost the earthy flavor of the squab. And I'm gonna sweeten it up with some uh, blueberry and port sauce. And I have some baby fennel in the sous vide. Hopefully it will be done in time. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Do you now feel you have a point to prove, Sean? Yes. I need to prove to you that I can give more to the plate than I gave in my signature dish. You cooked your pigeon beautifully well last time. That's added on pressure. Can you do it twice? Hopefully, hopefully I can. Good luck. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you. I think the dish sounds amazing. Did you smell those potatoes cooking away with the garlic and the rosemary? If he can cook the garnish as well as he cooked his pigeon the first round, we are in for a cracking dish, Greg. You've got 30 minutes left, you're halfway. I need to prove to Marcus today that I can cook, I'm a good chef, I understand flavours. I don't think he's got a very high opinion of me at the minute, so I just need to cook my heart out and better than the other guys, and hopefully I can, like, obviously I wish him all the best, like, but I don't want to go home. Daniel, tell me what you're doing. You give me pretty much my favourite ingredient in the world, so... Really? Yeah, I absolutely adore pigeon, I think it's fantastic. I'm doing squad breast. I've stuffed the legs with a sort of light, sort of black pudding mousse, uh, some nice baby potato mash. Uh, roasted heritage carrots, some charred, charred leaves, and just a light sherry vinegar sauce. You're not going to try and attempt to do something that you've, you've never done before? No. Or try and attempt to show us something that we've never seen before? Yeah, I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing to tell you, but every single thing I'm putting on this plate I've cooked quite a lot in the past. So I'm hoping it's going to be absolutely spot Thank on. Thank God for that. That's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. He looks happy, he looks content, he looks like he's on for a, a good cooking day today. I'm really, really looking forward to tasting Daniel's dish. Like a bit of vegetable with your batter, chef. <laughs> Love it. I'm ambitious, I'm a good cook. I've done, I can do interesting flavours, I can do classical cookery. I don't want to say I can do everything, but I can't, but I'm always learning, so I want to see see how far I can go in the competition. Tell me, what are you cooking for us today? Uh, I'm doing a really light pigeon salad. Salad? Yeah. OK. I'm going to do some really delicately dressed lentils, some pickled carrots, roasted carrots. I'm going to finish it with a really, really light blackberry vinaigrette. Are you feeling confident? Um, not as confident as I'd like to be, no. Well, what was the matter? i just not done a lot with squad pigeon. I, can, I know how to cook it, but I want to get it right. I think we should let him get on with it, Greg. Thank you. Thank Good you, luck. Chef. Thank you, Chef. Jamie said he rarely cooks pigeon. That's a drawback. That's a major drawback. But some lightly cooked vegetables, some raw, some flavoured lentils, it could just work. You've got 15 minutes left. Keep it up. Give me another seat, please. What's happened here? What, what's going on? I just knocked a knife off my side, and somehow by some one in a million chance, it sort of wedged as it fell between the, the work surface and my leg. I'm going to have to get you an ambulance, mate. Yeah. The cooking goes on. You've got five minutes left.
That's it. Your time's up. First up is Jamie, who roasted the pigeon breast and served it with poi lentils, celery, broad beans and flat leaf parsley in a mustard vinaigrette, with roasted carrots, roast and pureed parsnips, and a blackberry jus made using pigeon legs and wings. Are you happy? No. What's the matter? I think it's nicely cooked, but I just didn't get the rest enough. I get sweet acidity, I get really deep, almost, almost fruity, smoky sauce. Very, very lovely match to, to, that, to that pigeon. Jamie, I think that's excellent. I really do. The first thing I went for were the carrots. I thought they looked fantastic. They tasted even better. Mm. Beautiful roasting. The lentils have got a, just a very nice little bite to them, which I really like. I think the sauce is delicious. Mm. And of course, the best bit of all is the pigeon itself. Yes, it's bled a little bit, but actually I think you've done the bird justice and I think the pigeon tastes divine. Thank you, thank you very much. Let me have another go at that because that sauce really surprised me with those lentils. We've, we've both been back now for seconds. Yeah. And uh, I think that says it all. Yeah, I, I think we're both uh, thoroughly enjoying eating your food, Jamie. Thank you very much. Thank you. Words can't describe. I wanted to cry and I wanted to jump out and kiss him. <laughs> George seared his pigeon breasts and served them on a bed of puy lentils, pancetta and Swiss chard, accompanied by baby carrots and a red currant sauce. Taking the bird off the bone and pan frying it doesn't sound like the sort of thing that would be done in the restaurant that you work in. In the pub, you'd cook it on the crown. It depends. I mean, we've, from where I work, we've done it both ways. OK. The lentils aren't cooked enough, which is such a shame. The pigeon just has a, a meaty flavour. I don't feel like you've brought out the big flavour of the pigeon that I was really looking for, uh, and which you would have got if you'd cooked it on the bone, maybe. I just feel it just needs a bit of, sort of, another level. Okay. I like the texture of the pigeon. I don't, however, like the lentils. Uh, they're not cooked enough, and they don't pack a punch. They're a little bit mediocre. And it's lacking flavour because the lentils haven't absorbed the sauce. A little bit disappointed. I kind of knew in the back of my head that some parts of it weren't as I wanted it to be, and uh, the things I got wrong kind of spoiled the rest of the dish. Last up is Sean, who's cooked his pigeon sous vide and served it with rosemary garlic potatoes, fennel, and a blackberry port sauce infused with pigeon trimmings. I love the way you stacked it beautifully well, and my eye is just drawn to something that I don't normally see with a pigeon, which is a coolie. That's before, Sean. You've done a fantastic job with the pigeon cookery, and I think you've got the art of that modern technique down to a T. The disappointing bit about this dish is that none of the garnish is cooked enough. Potato shouldn't be al dente. It shouldn't be crunchy on the palate. It, it, it should be cooked. The sauce, it feels like it's a, it's a fruit in a meat base. That's what it tastes like. And I think you've got a, a good quantity of seasoning to sit on top of it, which is sort of taking away from what is considered a coolie. It's a very interesting sauce. You're really exciting in parts, but as yet you haven't delivered something that everybody agrees is wonderful. There's always a bit of an issue. I think you owe it to yourself to get everything absolutely right, because I'm sure you could be great. Marcus liked my style. I think he found my food interesting. He knew that if, if everything was cooked the right way, it would have been a fantastic dish. Well, Monica, it's been an eventful day. Daniel had an accident and had to go off to hospital. So that leaves us now with three chefs. One fantastic dish, really, really pleased with from Jamie, really good. He'd taken everything we'd said to him on board about his first dish, about going over the top, doing too much, and cooked a beautiful dish, Monica. It was excellent. That's great to hear.
He did a good round for me. He deserves to go through. I would love to see Jamie Cook again. That leaves us with George and Sean. Sean was actually quite weak on, on my round. He had never prepared a whole belly of pork that way. So I would like to hear that he was quite strong in your round to convince me. Today, we all wanted to see more garnish. He brought some fantastic ideas to the table, but unfortunately they were undercooked. But he cooked the pigeon today very well, just as good as he cooked it the first time round. His sauce looked like a fruit coulis, thinking, oh no, not fruit coulis. But there was a lovely, meaty, fruity flavour going on, and that tells me he does have a sense of flavour. I found cooking in an hour really tough. If I do go through, I'm going to need three hours. <laughs> George was actually the, the stronger one on, on my round. He had great knife skills, removed the rib without a problem, very confident in doing that, so I was quite impressed with his skills on the day. George's dish today was all about where he works, which is exactly what I wanted him to do. He just didn't get it over the finish line. The lentils weren't cooked enough, they didn't absorb the sauce. Presentation wasn't great. But I like George. I think George has potential. I would still love to get through to the quarterfinals and just keep trying my hardest and eventually maybe Marcus will turn around to me one day and be happy. I'm struggling with George and Sean. They've both let themselves down today. It's a tough one. We've now seen you cook over three different rounds. We've discussed it, we've made a decision, and one of you will be leaving us today. The chef leaving the competition is George. Obviously didn't have the impression and impact that I wanted to have. Back to the pub where I work, so yeah, that'll be good. You're quarter finalists, well done. Congratulations, guys. Great job. I'm the quarter finalist of MasterChef. It's unreal. It's unreal. So I'm just gonna let loose and give it all I've got. My goal is to get to the final Master Chef, and then my next goal will be to win it. So I'll get the first one first. Next time, it's the quarter final. First, the contestants will have to survive the ultimate invention test. It takes a lot of skill to know how to get so much flavor out of scraps. Only the best of them will get to cook for the critics. It is everything a proper dessert should be. How can you do what you do for a living? You're so wrong. Uh -huh.